I want to take you on a short journey as I remind some of God's word for us for this season. And I bring to the awareness of others of what God has been saying to us. Because if you were here during the time of prayer and fasting we had a couple of weeks ago, we began to find direction in the Spirit by the Spirit. Let me begin by saying that timing is critical to everything God does. Whether it's in the realm of the spirit or in the realm of the natural, timing is critical to everything God does. There's a popular adage that we are accustomed to making or quoting in our client, and that is that God's Time is the best. That's not necessarily found in scripture because some of you think is in Isaiah somewhere. God's time is the best. But at least there's a scripture that is closely related to that in the book of Ecclesiastes. He makes all things beautiful in its time. And I want us tonight to take a close look at the significance of timing in the unfolding of God's purpose on the earth and in the unfolding of God's agenda. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and that's the moon. And he made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. When God was creating or recreating the earth, we read in this passage of scripture that he put in the firmament of the heavens the sun, the moon, and the stars for one singular purpose, to divide the day from the night to be indicators for signs, for seasons, and for days and years. Now, the timeless God, and you know that God is timeless, and he also dwells outside of time. Eternity itself is not adequately defined because Eternity would just mean living forever. It doesn't adequately define that dimension where God dwells. But pardon me if we use eternity to mean living forever. And that that's where God dwells and operates from. But when God would create the earth or recreate the earth as we understand it to be. God introduced the moon, the sun the stars upon the face of the earth to define time for us. Because he knew that the people he was going to put upon the earth and the plants and everything that he was going to create upon the earth would need this timing to help bring some form of regulation to their lives. Are you with me? So the sun was put there for time, the moon was put there for time, for season, for years, 
and for days to introduce a sense of timing because of the sun and the moon you can say at certain points in your life I am late for an appointment or I am early for an appointment the sense of timing was put into the creative works of God so that we would learn to number our days. In Psalm 90, Moses was writing one of those unique Psalms that he wrote. Psalm 90, he was talking about his journey leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and how their lives were wasted under his watch simply because the people did not believe the word of God for them. Let's look at Psalm 90. Whenever people fail to believe God's word, they are sentenced by default to wandering and a wasting of years. Look at Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday. Every time I read this scripture, I say this, or what it means to me is that God is not limited by time. Because a thousand years, what it would take man a thousand years to do, God can do it in an instance of time. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. And like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger. And by your wrath, we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your anger. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years. That's not your portion. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because uh, Psalm 91 would say with long life... He will satisfy us and he would show us his salvation. That's not your portion. He's, he's writing from a narrative viewpoint. He's writing the journey of Israel in the wilderness. The days of our lives, 70 years. Reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet Moses died at 120. Yet their boast is only in labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off. And we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? As the fear of you, so is your wrath. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O oh Lord, how long? Now he's writing a narrative of his encounter with the children of Israel. They wasted their years because they didn't believe. I said this before that Moses is probably the greatest undertaker that ever lived. Because leading those children of Israel out of Egypt, all he was doing was conducting funeral services in the wilderness. 599,998 men died under the watch of Moses. And it wasn't Moses' fault. It was simply because they did not believe. In Numbers chapter 13, when they came to Kadesh Barnea, they did not need to go and spy the land. Why do you want to investigate what God has already investigated? Why do you need proof or evidence for what God has said he will give you and has given to you as a promise already? 
Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Why do you need the evidence? But they gathered themselves together and they said, we know that God has promised us the land. We will send spies. Let's go and investigate to see whether, uh, let's confirm for ourselves so that we will know whether God is serious about his promise or he's just playing pranks with us. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, if you are looking for evidence in order to believe God, you would waste your years upon the face of the earth and you would never be able to key into God's season for you. Because the only substance you need is your faith. And you may think faith is not tangible. But faith is a currency of the spirit. God recognizes it. And every time he sees faith. Heaven will respond to that faith. A Syrophoenician woman came. Her daughter was grievously vexed with a devil and 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 she came to plead to jesus and jesus said you're a samaritan it is not right to give children's bread to dogs she said uh, but uh, lord you are right but even the dogs can eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table and jesus said go your daughter is made whole but when before he said that he said in the whole of israel i have not seen faith like this Was her daughter healed when she said that? No. But she had sufficient faith in the fact that even though she had been called a dog, meaning an outcast is Samaritan, she could still receive the healing grace that he carried. Faith is your evidence, your substance for 2015. It is the substance of things that are hoped for. It is the evidence of things that are not seen. Someone says, have you seen what God would do? No. But I have faith that he would do it. And faith is both substance and evidence. Lawyers probably more than anyone understand the significance of evidence in legal proceedings. If there's a land dispute and you're brought before the judge And you ask the question, what is the proof that you own this land? Do you go and carve out the plot of land and bring to the court? Talk to me, somebody. Do you go take that 1,000 square meters in, whether it's in Wusetu, and you you dig it up, and you, you can't even do that. What do you do? You get your C of O. And every document, whether it's your deed of assignment, if you bought it off someone else, and you present it to who? To the judge. And once the judge can authenticate that document, he doesn't need to be taken to go see the land. Just by virtue of a document, a judge knows that the land exists. There's some things you don't need to show me. Show me your faith. I know it's there. Are you getting what I'm saying? If you come up to me and you say, God just bless you with a car, do I need to follow you to the car lot to see it? Talk to me, someone. Show me the keys. From the key, I can even tell what kind of car it is. 
If it's got the Toyota sign, you know it's a Toyota. Am I talking to someone today? Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7, the Bible says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. I don't have a child. When I have a child, I have a child because God says it. That's the faith of Abraham. See, where's the evidence? Oh, it's my faith. But I can't see anything. Just keep looking long enough. Keep your eyes fixed. You see physiological changes beginning to take place. You will find out that even though I've called myself father of many nations for many years, the nations will eventually manifest. Am I talking to someone here today? Eventually. That word eventually is a loaded word because it means through a series of events. It means there are many things that will take place for eventually to come into manifestation. Say to your neighbor, do you have faith for this season? As what Paul calls the foolishness of the cross. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Over Christmas we looked at Mary. The angel came to her. Blessed are you among women. Highly favored are you. God has sent me to you to say that you're going to have a child. And she asked the question, how can I have a child not knowing any man? It wasn't doubt. If you go back and see what happened with Zechariah, there was a difference. Zechariah did not believe what was going to happen. God shut his mouth. You wonder why? Because if his mouth was left open, he would have come out to use his own lips to cancel everything God wanted to do. Don't have time to teach that today. So Zechariah comes out of the temple and instead of blessing the people, he's, mm, he can't speak until Elizabeth puts to bed and then they ask him, what name shall the child be named? And he would scribble John. Then his mouth was open. God needed to shut him up so his word could be fulfilled. God needs to shut some of you up. So when you use your own mouth to cancel what God is said to do. Elizabeth said, or Mary said, how will these things be? And the angel responded, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And that thing which shall be conceived in you shall be called the Son of the Most High. And then she responded accurately be it unto me according to your word and she became pregnant just that statement can you lift your hands today and say father be it unto me according to your word for this season you're not sounding like people who really are looking for a manifestation of God's word in your life. Say, Father, be it unto me according to your word. Fulfill every word, every promise in my life in this season. 
Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 12. For man also knows not his time. That's the unregenerated man who's not in tune with the frequency of heaven as the fish that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Say to your neighbor, this would not be my portion. The significance of timing says when man does not know his time, like a fish is caught in an evil net, like a bird is caught in a snare, man is taken, he's caught, he's restricted, he finds himself bound simply because he does not understand timing. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says to us, to everything. There is a what? There is a season. And there is a time to what? To what? There is a time to what? To everything there is a season. And there is a time to every purpose. Without exception underneath the heaven if you read on it tries to break down different times and seasons so to speak there is a time verse 2 a time to be born and there is a time to die that's a principle you're running to a challenge when death occurs at the time of birth. That's called stillborn. That's painful. That's traumatizing. There's a time to plant and a time to pluck. When you've not planted and you expect to pluck, it can frustrate and, and, and annoy your spirit. Are you getting what I'm saying? There's a time to plant, there's a time to pluck. And in between planting and plucking is what? It's process. Am I talking to someone today? To everything there's a season, to every purpose under the heaven. When we look at timing, there are two dimensions of timing that I want you to understand and we're going to look at the scriptures and then we'll proceed from there. Number one is earthly timing. And the reason why I'm looking at this is to show you that God functions even within earthly timing. So let's not just think it's all about spiritual timing and God has no sense of chronology. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10 is one of those scriptures that elucidates this truth. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, not 70 spiritual years. Talk to me someone. 70 years exactly. According to chronology, to the calendar, natural calendar, I will visit you and watch this I'll visit you after 70 years and I will perform my word not just my word my good word toward you and I will cause you to return to this place now you need to understand that this is what Daniel was reading when he was praying or before he went to pray, Daniel was reading Jeremiah. He said, I understood by books the years that had been appointed. Now, did he hear the prophecy? No. Was it he that was prophesied to? No. What happened? He just opened the book of Jeremiah. And he realized that 
the dealings of God with Jeremiah synchronized with his time in Babylon. In other words, this is the season Jeremiah was talking about. 70 years had been appointed for them to be in captivity. And God said, at the end of 70 years, it won't happen in the 60th year. Even if you pray for it to happen. You can fast all you want. It will, the fasting will change you. <laughs> it won't change the situation. It won't change the, the time. Because he had appointed 70 years. So Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days. It didn't change the time. It didn't hasten the prophecy. But it repositioned Daniel to understand the mind of God for that season. So an angel was released to open his mind to understand what God was about to do through him and for his people. Timing is important to God. The reason I'm showing you all of this is that when God declares or releases a word for a particular time or season, what he is saying is that this is that time in your life that he has chosen to perform that good word. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's that time that he has chosen to perform that good word. And you need to take advantage of it. Said I'll cause you to return to this place. That's what you call earthly timing. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4 verse 3 and let's look at the spiritual dimension of this because to this there is no uh, specific moment that was spoken but even God's spiritual timing manifests in time. Are you getting what I'm saying? God's spiritual timing manifests in time. Look at verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come. Now when is the fullness of that time? Nobody knew. It didn't say it was 70 years. It didn't say it was a thousand years. But he knew. And when the fullness of that time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So in Jeremiah, we see an allotted time. In Galatians chapter 4, the Bible speaks about the fullness of time. Here's the good news. The fullness of time is upon us. Clearly, evidently, upon our lives to see an unfolding of God's desire upon our lives for this time because this same God we speak about is our God who has programmed our lives in times and seasons to manifest so that what he said concerning us, concerning us as being the light of the world and the salt of the earth would become a reality. Isaiah said, the Gentiles shall come to your light. 
if the Gentiles must come to our light, then God must do certain things in our lives, certain things through us that will cause them to come. If not, they will not come. Because we're not trying to be Gentiles. We're not trying to be like them. But they must be drawn to our light. They must be drawn to what God is doing in us. That if we do not manifest as sons of God, then it would not be possible for them to be drawn to our light. Say to your neighbor, get ready, get ready, get ready for the Gentiles to be drawn to you. And in case you don't understand what Gentiles means, it basically means unbelievers or those that are unsaved. Three years ago, and I want to remind you of this. Or two years ago, God spoke to us and he christened the year 2013 as the limitless season. He's christened the season as the limitless season. And within the context of that, God said to us clearly, it was going to be a three-year how do you say that? A three-year season. That, that, that word was going to span for three years. So 2014, we experienced the limitless season extended. And I remember, and in case you don't, I'll remind you. There was a reason why that happened. God said there were things that started in 2013 that he has not yet completed. And therefore, 2014 was the next phase of it. But 2015 is the third phase of that. And this phase is called fullness. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that by the time we're done with this season... You know, it's interesting that when the story of your life is being written, you usually uh, can't put the pieces of the puzzle together until, or, or you can't see it accurately until the end. Are you getting what I'm saying? So there are certain points in your life when, when you look back, you are able to write a clearer story of your life. Then you understand why there was a 2013. Then you understand why there was a 2014. And then you can see how every single thing adds up. By the time the season is expired, the entire picture would be complete. What he started, he will bring to fullness. I don't know what is started in you, but just cast your mind back, cast your mind back two years. I don't know what it is he started in you, but I'm saying to you today what he started, he is bringing to a fullness in this season. I remember saying, God said, this wave, which is the third wave of the limitless season, is the wave of fullness some of you are not excited that's okay let me define fullness for you I'll assume you don't know fullness is the state of being filled to capacity You can write it down. It's also defined as the state of having eaten enough or more than enough and actually feeling full. It is also the state of being complete or being made whole. Let me read you a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Is somebody with me? 
Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Now, can God give you things you didn't labor for? No, I, no you didn't hear me. You, you don't even believe it. Can God give you what you didn't labor for? That's what he promised them. <laughs> Next verse. Houses full of all good things which you did not feel. Hewn out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. And then he says, you know, this beats my theology. Well, used to beat my theology. God says, when you have eaten and you are full. So, if you are eaten and you are not full, it's not been fulfilled yet. The only person who knows he's full is the eater. Yes, sir. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. If you give me a spoon of rice, or if I give you a spoon of rice and one piece of meat, and you eat it, and I say, you look full. I can't determine the state of your fullness. It is you who would say, I am full. How many of you have said to God, I am full? And this is not greed. Because it's the one that introduced it anyway. He said, when you have eaten and are full. The next verse is interesting. Now, this is where there is caution. Beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. From the house of bondage. And you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. And shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. In other words, you won't forsake the God who brought you into this dimension. Say to your neighbor, get ready to be full. To be full means he will satisfy you. You know what David says in the book of Psalms? He opens his hands and he satisfies the desire of every living thing. He satisfies it. Get ready to be satisfied. A womb is not satisfied until there's a child in it. Oh, Proverbs says that. I think it's Proverbs chapter 31. It says that there are four things, three things, four things that never say enough. Number one, it says fire. Ever seen substance being thrown into fire and fire says I've had enough. It will leak everything up. Number two, the grave. The grave would never say enough. Number three, desert land. No matter how much you pour water in it, it will never say enough. Number three, a womb. Number four, a womb that has not received child. Look, that's natural and spiritual. But he said he will satisfy you. He will fill it up. Hallelujah. Say to your neighbor, you will eat until you are full. Turn to somebody else and say, you will eat until you are full. 
I don't know whether there are people here tonight. It don't sound like you are here. Sound. You lead unto your fool. Because that's the season that's upon us. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Until I am fool. If I'm not fool, I have right to demand. I have right to activate my faith to make sure that until I am fool, this is the season of fool. So let me tell you what to expect in 2015 because that is very, very important and there are seven things. You can write it down one after the other. Number one, expect the fullness of the fulfillment of promises. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says in verse 20 that every promise, all the promises of God that are in Christ Jesus find their yea and amen in him. Expect the fullness of promises to be made manifested in your life in 2015 in the name of Jesus. Now, there, there's this you need to understand about promises. There are promises that are in scripture. And yes, they include the promises that are in scripture. But then there are promises God has made to you personally. Are you getting what I'm saying? One of the promises he made in scripture was to Jacob... Genesis chapter 28, when he had that encounter at Bethel, he said to him, I will not leave you until I have fulfilled my good word concerning you. To Jacob, he knew that anywhere he went, God was with him. That was a fulfillment of promise. But then there are promises that God has made to you personally. The truth is that as we relate and as we have fellowship with him, there are things that he speaks to our heart. Not things that are prophesied by people. Not things that may necessarily come out of scripture. You may not have, as it were, a particular scripture. But you know he said it to you. You know he said to you, I will build you up. And make you strong until you become a pillar and a force in your own field and in your own territory. That is a promise he has made to you. I'm just telling you things he has spoken to me. And that's that's mine. And that's that's me. That's but you can claim it too. Are you getting what I'm saying? And he's saying, number one, expect the fullness of those things to come to pass. Fullness of his promises. Expect it. Number two. The things to expect. Number two. The fullness of abundance. Abundance is a good word no matter how much you dislike it. <laughs> abundance simply means more than enough. Uh, more than enough. Paul was praying and he used these words paraphrased. That you will abound more and more in this grace unto every good work Abundance is what makes generosity exciting. (laughs) 
are you getting what I'm saying? And that's a dimension that God intends that you will operate in. Because when it is overflowing, are you getting what I'm saying? Other people are blessed by you and through you. The fullness of abundance that you will have beyond what you require. So that you would be able to distribute and make impact in the lives of people by blessing them with that which he brings. Number two, expect the fullness. That's number two, fullness of abundance. Some of you are going to spend money like you've never spent before. Only half of them caught it. Okay, maybe you've positioned yourself as the ones that will benefit from the abundance of others. Number three, the fullness of joy. Uh, that's not happiness. That's joy. Isaiah chapter 35 verse 10. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs. And everlasting joy shall be what? Upon their heads. They shall obtain what? Joy have you ever thought, how do you obtain joy and gladness? You receive joy and gladness. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall what? Shall flee away. And please hear me because I said this during our prayer and fasting. One thing you must not look at is look at oil price dollar price exchange rate if not you will short circuit what god is about to do in your life no matter the exchange rate of the dollar to the naira god's resources are unlimited i said this clearly that every time there's a recession all that happens is that money changes hands some will lose and it will flow in the hands of others who will gain. And you will not be a part of those that will lose. But it will flow in your direction. In the name of Jesus. When Israel left Egypt, Egypt experienced a recession. What happened? It was a transfer of wealth. By the time they left, Israel had everything. They had the resources of Egypt. They had the blessing of Egypt. They had the treasures of Egypt. There was a wealth transfer. Oh, God's word says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up in store for the righteous. In this season, God will give you the strategies that you require to access the wealth of the wicked. One man will labor, you will enter into his labor can go read the book of Ecclesiastes and say, it's not a curse. It's in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon says, I've seen something upon the earth that shakes me to the foundation of a root. To, 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 to the foundation of my roots. He said, God gives a man, God gives him power to get wealth. But God does not give him power to eat. He labors. He amasses it. And it's God that extends to him that power. And he says, a stranger comes in his stead. Who has power to eat? That's to the wicked. You are the stranger that he's talking about. Say to your neighbor, the fullness of joy. 
in the midst of discouragement, God said to Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When the Lord turned our captivity around, we were like them. That's a different category of people. Them who dream dreams. Simply meaning it was too good to be true. Have you ever had an experience where something happened, something good happened, and you literally had to pinch yourself? You slept and woke up, and you thought it was a dream. And you had to peep at that object again. I don't know whatever it was. To just be sure, maybe it was your car, you know. You just went to check. Is it still in the driveway? And the truth is, if it had been taken away, you probably would have said, I I thought, I I mean, I said it. It was a dream. But this one would not be taken away. Number four, thing to expect, fullness of peace in the midst of chaos. Second Thessalonians says in chapter 3 and verse 16, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. That's the way the NIV puts it. He'll give you peace always by all means. Peace is rest assured for you. Rest assured. Now I say this with a deep sense of responsibility. Because our nation is going to go through seasons of uncertainty. So when God says, I'll give you fullness of peace, he knows exactly what he's talking about. There's a peace that flows like a river. It's not an external one, but it's an internal one. Are you getting what I'm saying? I shared something on Facebook because I was was writing the visions and the burdens in my heart. And I said, I saw the picture of a woman in travail, going through pain. And as I stood and I watched, there was an uncertainty in me as to whether the woman will give birth or the child would would be stillborn. There was also an uncertainty about the woman itself. And in the midst of that, I saw a hand released from heaven. Now, uh, there's certain things about that hand. Because when I say I saw a hand released from heaven, the other thing God said to me is that it's important for us to take our place in prayer in order to release that hand to help that delivery process of that woman. And I saw the woman delivered of that child. The child lived. The woman lived. And that's talking about Nigeria. Number five, expect the fullness of favor. You've experienced favor in time past. Expect a greater dimension of favor. Look, I can't preach to you about favor. But every time we look at the subject of favor, Esther comes to mind. The decree of the king was against her. And yet, what happened? Every decree was suspended for her sake. Favor simply brings a suspension of every handwriting and everything that has been written against you is suspended. So expect the fullness of favor. Number six, expect 
the fullness of grace. Hebrews chapter 4. Look, grace is so powerful. Let us come boldly to the throne of, of, of mercy that we may obtain, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is grace? It's God's enabling, enablement. It means that you would have ability to function beyond your own imagination. It means you will surpass your own strength. You will surpass your own limits. You will surpass your own abilities. You will do things and you will wonder, is it me doing it? Are you getting this? Finally, the last one before we close this book and open the next book. Expect the fullness of opportunities and an unlimited supply of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Expect the fullness of opportunities. I don't know what opportunities you've experienced in time past, but there's coming what is known as the fullness of opportunities. You heard someone's testimony. It's true. It's happened to me before. Where someone else's appointment letter is shredded for you because the door God has opened for you is not meant for someone else so if someone else's name has been credited to that door in error are you getting what I'm saying if they've taken your place in error Get ready for the fullness of opportunities. And the release of God's wisdom. The release of his knowledge. And the release of depths of understanding for you in this season. Stand on your feet. We have just about a minute left I want you to lift up your voices and begin to thank God for these things that is bringing your way. It is on the screen. Put it back on the screen, all those points, so that it can be set before you as you give him thanks. Thank him for the fulfillment or the fullness or the fulfillment of promises. The fullness of abundance the fullness of joy the fullness of peace in the midst of chaos the fullness of favor the fullness of grace the fullness of opportunities in 2015 Labashata <laughs> Lebre do sakaya bashanda kala bregedea. Lebo kosi kele bregedosha. Seven seconds more. Five, three, two, one. Happy New Year.